Welcome to Seattle's Kingdom, opening night 1977, the new expansion Seattle Mariners and the California Angels. And the first pitch on the way to Bakke. It's a curveball on the ground ball, face up, right field. Here comes Leon Robert and the Mariners have swept the New York Yankees. They beat them 6-5, an incredible three-game series against New York. And the 1-1 pitch to Alvin. Swung on and belted deep to right center field. Castillo looks up. It is grand salami time. Alvin Davis. My, oh, my. And they're going Bonzo at the kingdom, waving the towel. Bottom of the ninth. The 1-1 pitch on the way to Presley. Swung on and belted deep to left center field. Pettis goes back. This will The story of 10 years of Mariner baseball. A diamond in the Emerald City. April 6th, 1977, right here on 4th Avenue in Seattle, Major League Baseball came rolling back to town. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Niehaus, and I was lucky enough to be here 10 years ago, part of a motorcade of antique cars that celebrated the birth of a new franchise, the Seattle Mariners. What a day that was. The feeling along the streets was electric. Major League Baseball was back in Seattle, back in the Pacific Northwest. The motorcade that cruised along 4th Avenue was symbolic both of the return of baseball to a major league city and of a victory over the past. Seattle's baseball past had once meant six stadium, a place that conjured up warm memories of the Rainiers and rather less nostalgia for the star-crossed pilots. In 1969, the pilots of the American League played their first and only season in Seattle. The outmoded condition of Six Stadium undermined the franchise's chances for success throughout a difficult first season. The pilots were also something less than world beaters on the field. But despite the problems, nobody expected what happened before the 1970 season. In shocking fashion, the pilots left spring training and went to Milwaukee abandoning Seattle. Well, there was a lot of bitterness. Seattle uh, always considered itself a baseball town, and the pilots were here just for a very brief time and left, and uh, uh, I was a new county executive. We went off and we uh, had meetings with everybody possible and talked about lawsuits or agreements, and uh, it, was a, it was a very black mood uh, and a determination to get baseball back. That determination spurred the building of the Kingdom. 443 tons of structural steel and the first facility of its kind in the West. Fittingly built in Pioneer Square, the multipurpose King Dome proclaimed Seattle's intention to be recognized as a major league town. At the same time, a group of investors petitioned the American League for a franchise. And finally, the Lords of Baseball began to respond. We originally were going to get, based on urging of the officials of the American League, it was a chance to move the White Sox to Seattle. One reason or another, it did not work out. We also tried to bring the, uh, buy the uh, uh, San Francisco Giants and move that team here. That didn't work out. Uh, they came back to us in the January of 1976. A lot of urging to go for an expansion team. A franchise was indeed granted to a group of investors that included entertainer Danny Kay, and it was he, in his own inimitable style, who let everybody know it was official. If you want me to talk to you legally, I can do that. Because in the interim, having yet withdrawn the basic pliable causes within the framework of that which has not yet been related to the incidental matter, having yet withdrawn the influx, having yet, then I say we have a deal. <laughs> Outside of that, we're in the baseball business. The first task of this new business was to pick a man to oversee the building of the baseball operations. We had to go out and scout the other teams to build our team to make our selections that fall. And I gradually began to hire, I guess by June or July, I had nine scouts working for me. And all our concentration was on getting ready for the preparation to draft our 30 players in the fall. 
In the fall of 1976, an expansion draft was held by the American League. The structure heavily favored the existing teams, but the newly born Mariners carefully studied the available pool and made a good first selection. Rupert Jones, center fielder, Kansas City, is the first choice by the Seattle Mariners in the expansion draft. In typical expansion fashion, the roster soon became a combination of raw recruits and aging talent. Nevertheless, the maiden voyage of the Mariners was underway. April 6, 1977, and baseball fever was sweeping across Seattle on opening day. The spirit of, we can do it together, actually had grown men and women singing together about baseball. Along 4th Avenue, that famous motorcade really was a victory for Seattle. A diamond had finally been replaced in the Emerald City. They paraded the players through, and there were people lining the streets and people cheering. This was really something. I and mean, baseball was back in Seattle. Major League Baseball had returned to Seattle. And that was a great occasion. Really was. A sellout crowd of more than 57,000 fans flocked to the King Dome to celebrate baseball on opening day. Manager Daryl Johnson presented the lineup at home plate. The squad of 25 players was introduced, and Senator Scoop Jackson threw out the first ball. A truly festive feeling rang through the King Dome as the Seattle Mariners took to the field for the first time. On the mound was 13-year veteran Diego Segui, and his first pitch right on target. Segui was backed this day by such names as Collins, Baez, Stein, Reynolds, and Braun. The opposition, the California Angels, and they eventually proved to be too much in sinking the Mariners 7-0. But if one player rose to the surface quickly, it was the original Mariner, Rupert Jones. In 77, Jones batted 263 with 24 home runs and 76 RBIs and also was the only rookie named to the American League All-Star team. Clearly, Seattle took to Rupert and the feeling was mutual. I came in right on time. I got picked up in the expansion draft and I got to a city that really wanted baseball, and really loved baseball. And uh, the people there are fantastic. We have, we, we have a nice turnout. We got, we got a nice team. My team played with a lot of heart and desire. And, uh, I'm telling you, I'm having the most fun I've had in my life this year. They loved Rupert. You know, you could hear Roop, Roop, Roop when he'd come to the plate. And everybody loved it. And he played center field and was an outstanding center fielder, made some great catches. And it was fun to watch him play, it really was. He became a very important part of this community because people could really associate with him. Here was the young rookie, Rupert Jones, coming up here. And every place you'd go, you hear, yeah, Roop, you know, go get him, babe. When you play hard and you play aggressive and you do a lot of things right and you do some things right, People kind of t have a tendency to, to catch on to that. People like to see people that work hard and d give the best they got. Other Mariners who gave their best included Lee Stanton, who led the ball club with 27 home runs and also racked up 90 runs batted in, which tied him for the team lead with Danny Meyer. In 1977, the Mariners were struggling to prove they could play to the fans, to the league, to themselves. And another who proved he could win was a game 26-year-old pitcher named Glenn Abbott. He led the club with 12 victories. All in all, it was a successful first season as the M's won 10 more games than their fellow expansionists, the Toronto Blue Jays, and also finished ahead of the Oakland A's in the Western Division. At the gate, the club drew over 1,300,000 fans an expansion club for babies in the very complicated world of baseball, we have done remarkably well. Danny Kaye's optimism carried over in 1978 as the Mariners continued to reach out in search of a winning formula. That wouldn't be easy, but one man thought he'd found it. We have uh, some guys that are going to be capable big league ball players. Some of them are fairly capable right now, and they're going to improve as our younger ball players. I think that we'll keep adding those young ball players until such time we walk out there's a group of people and beat somebody's brains out. Well, in 1978, the Mariners didn't exactly beat anybody's brains out, but 23-year-old Julio Cruz helped run some opposition into the ground. In his first full season, Cruz stole 59 bases, third best in the majors, and the most stolen by a player that young in 57 years. That's how I got to the big league, was uh, on my legs. I think the men upstairs. Uh, they just let me run at will. 
They said, cruiser, you get on, you go. Don't even wait. Now, uh, I would have to go and uh, find out, check the lineup, who's batting behind me, and ask the guy uh, if he didn't mind that I would just run. Well, Julio Cruz was batting first, and I batted second behind him. And I probably had the best year of my career batting behind him because he was a base stealing threat, and when he got on base, he was going to steal. His percentage of stealing bases was phenomenal. He created things, and consequently, it made me a better ball player and a better hitter just being around him. Uh, he was one of the best defense second basemen I've ever seen. At second base, Cruz recorded a fielding percentage of 987, which quite simply was the best in the American League. I always think of um, Julio Cruz as being uh, the most dynamic uh, fielding second baseman that I've ever seen play the game. And I really thought he could impact the game more defensively than any second baseman, maybe any infielder. And that's what he did. Despite the presence of a glove man like Julio Cruz, the Mariners in the early years sometimes found their baseball world turned topsy-turvy as they worked to get their feet back on the ground. One addition who helped the Mariners strike a better tune joined the ball club in 1979. He was Willie Horton. A veteran of 15 seasons, Horton was remarkable, and he was a man the Mariners could rely on. If there was a big run to be scored, Willie Horton always drove him in. He had an incredible year in 1979. Willie was, uh, was just great, just really Mr. Clutch, and, and did a lot for that ball club, and he was just outstanding. Known affectionately as the Ancient Mariner, Horton blasted 29 homers, drove in 106 runs, and was voted the outstanding designated hitter of the year. He also reached a personal milestone, the 300th home run of a highly productive career. Mariner fans had that to cheer about in 1979, as well as a spectacular showcase exhibition that took place in July. July 17, 1979, and the eyes of the baseball world turned to Seattle for the playing of the 50th All-Star Game. The diamond in the Emerald City shined like never before, as the Mariners were determined to put on a big league show. It was a star-studded occasion that featured the best ball players in the game, and Seattle fans responded enthusiastically. But of the many ovations that night, the longest and loudest was for the Mariners' own All-Star, Bruce Bakhti. I was real nervous. Just the fact that the, the, the spotlight was sort of on me because uh, I was the representative from the Seattle team that year uh, really made me edgy. And uh, I was uh, overwhelmed by the fact that I got a standing ovation. I didn't really expect it. This was a game full of the unexpected from the first ball ceremony on. One unforgettable moment in this all-star game was Dave Parker's spectacular throw home. The American League's Brian Downing out at the plate as Gary Carter handled Parker's throw and made the tag. But on this evening of stellar suspense, Seattle fans may best remember when Bruce Bakhti was called on to pinch hit with the game tied. I think the energy of the stadium at the time was so intense and everybody was pulling for me that what would have might have been normally a ground ball hit into the astroturf so hard that it bounced over the shortstop's head in the left field for a hit. And, uh, uh, it was a very unusual hit for me, but it did, um, it did the job and it put the American League ahead and it was a big moment. I think the All-Star game probably had to be, uh, no doubt, the, the most, it was certainly the pinnacle moment of my career. Finishing 1979 with a 316 batting average, Bakhti was among the top 10 in the American League. He also repeated with a 300 season in 1980. While artistic success may still have been rare on the field, off-the-field talent was emerging in an effort to make the struggling ball club more appealing to its fans. You might say the element of humor was called in from the bullpen. We had by far the best commercials of any team in baseball, and it was really funny because we would just make them up on the spot. Pachorik happened to be one that not only was willing to do it, but quite capable of doing it also. And he sort of broke the ice. He was, he, in an early spot, he went on and did some uh, 
horrible imitations. Tom Pashorek, oh, okay. Mariner hitter, fielder, and impressionist. All right, Pilgrim. I'm here to invite you to come out to the kingdom. Hi, this is Ed Sullivan, inviting all you fans in the greater Seattle area. The this is Jimmy Stewart. Inviting now, everyone Mariner the manager, Daryl Johnson. Area. Tom hits well, feels well, but his Jimmy Stewart uh, needs a lot of work. Now, come on out and watch him. Good night. I think my favorite spot was the one with uh, Lenny Randall, and it was for it was for the it was for Jack at night. Now here's Lenny Randall. When the Mariners beat the Red Sox, hitting baseballs yeah. out of sight. Mm -hmm. Every kid who's 14 and under uh, will wanna come come to Jack at night. Ha! But frankly, humor couldn't hide poor performance. Daryl Johnson was fired after losing more than 60% of his games. Taking his place as manager was Maury Wills, yet the losing continued. Soon, however, a new era would be underway for the Mariners and Seattle baseball. In the first few years of the Mariners franchise, nobody expected a winner. Everyone knows that expansion clubs aren't capable of instant penance. But in the early 1980s, there was a feeling on the club that something good could happen. Names like Caudill and Pashorik and Bakhti and Cruz had the whole town talking. And rightly so, there were some lively personalities on that ball club. It was a time of great anticipation. Yeah, hopes were high. Some would say too high but at least things were finally looking up. By the end of 1980, it was clear that the old regime had lost its taste for the business of baseball. On January 14, 1981, control of the Mariners was sold to George Argerus, a real estate developer from Southern California. We will begin immediately in the process of continuing to build a winning team here in Seattle. I'd been successful uh, in our various business events Ventures and, and uh, uh, I was at a point in my life where uh, it was time to go on to other things and I wanted to do something besides make money. And here was uh, somebody coming in, a California owner coming in with some dollars that said, hey, I want to get this franchise moving and let's, you know, upgrade everything. And after going through a lull and, you know, and a lot of, uh, you know, just, uh, I guess, uh, leveling off, for lack of a better word, yeah, it, it, it seemed to pump everybody back up and let's get this thing going. The first move in that direction was making Rene Latchman the manager. Barely older than his players, Latchman brought a new style to the job. My basic uh, team talk to him was that uh, we're gonna go ahead and you know try and have some fun in this game and in order to have fun, you have to go ahead and win. In fact, the Rene Latchman era with the Seattle Mariners began with a bang. On May 8, 1981, two days after Latchman took over, Mariner fans were treated to the vision of something new and enjoyable. The Yankees had come to town, and the M seemed to reach back for something extra in going against New York. In the bottom of the ninth, Tom Pushuri came to bat in a tie game and got a hold of one, a drive deep to left and out. The Mariners had beaten New York and raised their franchise record against the Yankees to a remarkable 16-8 and eight in the kingdom. I think when the Yankees come in, it's a big thing for, for the Mariners. Uh, it was at that time to go ahead and try and, and beat that club. And just because you wear, you know, pinstripes or it says New York across your, your uniform, the people are going to fall down and, and die on you. As a matter of fact, that, uh, when it said New York on the uniform, it made our people play that much harder. The very next night, Saturday, May 9th, that night at the King Dome, New York's Ron Davis stood on the mound protecting a two-run lead, two out on the ninth. But the Mariners had two men on, and at the plate, that man again. The 2-1 pitch to Bishorek. Fastball swung on it, belted to left. Winfield looks up. The Mariners win it again. It will fly away. Oh, my, I don't believe it. That was really was by far the biggest thrill I've ever had in baseball because, um, 
Uh, there was a lot of fans there. I think there was about 60,000 fans there, and it was kind of an opportunistic night. If you were going to do anything good, that was a great night to, to, to do it in because uh, of the number of fans there. There were 50,000 people here, and for 15 or 20 minutes after the game, every kid in the place was pounding the bats and cheering, and, and they were just bananas. I've never seen the more enthusiasm for baseball in Seattle, I don't think, than that one moment, even either before or after it happened. It just sent chills up and down everybody's spine. I know it did for myself and uh, for everybody that, you know, in the, in the area of Seattle. It brought a lot of fans back to watch baseball in Seattle. A fully matured Julio Cruz had Mariner fans watching as well. Stealing bases with abandon, Cruz seemed uncatchable. In fact, in 1981, he was cruising towards an American League record for stolen base efficiency. I was, what, 27? And I can run then. Oh, I can run. And, and plus, I also had that uh, little extra spark. Every time I checked uh, the scorecard or the, the stat sheet, it had, at the time, 21 stolen bases. CS, caught stealing, zero. And then I would look another week, 28 stolen bases, CS, zero. And then 30, C, caught stealing, zero. And that was an incentive also. So that made me kind of even much quicker, a step or so faster than what I usually was, I believe. Cruz was on his way to a record. The pitch on the way to Baki as Cruz goes. It's outside, throw through to second is not in time. He's tied the record. Julio Cruz has stolen 32 in a row. Hello. Are you Julio Cruz? Yes, I am. Mr. Cruz, we're police detectives. We have a search warrant. Do you mind if we come inside? No, you guys can't come in. I'm afraid you don't have much choice, Mr. Cruz. Chuck, you take a look in the bedroom there. Bill, come with me. There's one in here, Sarge. While nobody would mistake Julio Cruz for Tom Cruise, he was a true Seattle star. In his career as a Mariner, he led the team in steals six straight years and Cruz's stolen base percentage among the all-time best. In the strike-shortened season of 1981, the hitters also made their mark. Newly acquired Richie Zisk had a remarkable year as a designated hitter. Batting 390 in April, Zisk stayed in a groove and led the league in hitting from late August until mid-September. Meanwhile, teammate Tom Pashorek was also in the thick of the race, taking over the lead for a brief spell in mid-August and then moving out in front again on September 18. But the chase for a batting crown can wear on anyone, and in the closing weeks, Zisk fell into a slump and would finish his year with a 3-11 average, seventh best in the league. He went into just an unbelievable tailspin, and in the last two weeks, it became a battle between Carney Lansford and myself. For the, uh, for the batting title. Pashorek and Lansford went neck and neck until the end, but eventually the Oakland third baseman prevailed in the batting race. Yet still, Seattle Mariner Tom Pashorek finished a proud second in the American League. You know, hitting 326 was a great accomplishment for me, and it's, uh, you know, something that I'll always remember. There was a good feeling as the Mariners gathered in Arizona for spring training 1982, now in his first full season, manager Latchman welcomed to the ball club some pitchers who could make a difference. The newcomers included Bill Cotto and veteran Gaylord Perry. Latchman also instituted a new concept in preseason preparation. He had what he called the Latchman Olympics, and he would wrap up a newspaper and come running out of the dugout, light the top of it, and run to the mound like this, and hold up his hand and say, the Latchman Olympics began. And what it was, they had a throwing contest for the catchers, you know, to hit into a barrel at second base. And then they had a, a two-mile run for all the pitchers. And uh, the pitchers really hated this. Gaylord and I always came up with mystery blisters or pulled hamstrings for a day just to avoid that. Because uh, I was a short reliever. I didn't see the sense in running two miles. And Gaylord, Gaylord just was too old and too tired to run two miles. So uh, we got around it, and then Latch had placed a bet with me saying that he, I couldn't run, you know, two miles. 
So this is where Cottle got involved in the thing. And so Cottle starts running like this, and he just continued to run. And finally, he did a belly flop and came sliding into home in the mud like this for the final thing. He said, I'm the winner. I'm the winner. It was the Latchman Olympics. It was delightful. Jim Beatty, you know, took an egg right on his forehead like this, you know, just, yay, there I am. <laughs> it was their way of celebrating. You know, the really tough, hard work that they thought they'd gone through in spring training is a chance to loosen everybody up, and we loved it. If there was anything that Rene Latchman loved in 82, it was the performance of his pitchers. That season, the Mariner staff would go on to notch 1,002 strikeouts, the top number in the American League. The individual strikeout leader was a Mariner as well. Floyd Bannister fanned 209 batters in 247 innings and his ERA of 343 among the best. Yet despite many solid performances from the staff, there were occasions when the starters came up a bit short. In 1982, Rene Latchman was a frequent visitor to the mound because he had relievers who could get it done. Probably he worked the bullpen better than any manager I've ever played with. Uh, he kept everybody fresh. He uh, used us all on a regular basis. He didn't go with who he thought was hot. He tried to keep everybody hot. The Mariners had the busiest bullpen in the league and one of the most effective. In his first season, Ed Vandenberg made a league-leading 78 appearances, which also set a Major League rookie record. Vandenberg served as setup man for the reliever Latchman most liked to call upon when it came time to close. That frequently used telephone would put Latchman through to Seattle's number one reliever in 1982. The quintessential fireman, Bill Cottle. Cottle's time in Seattle never dull. He was known by nicknames like the Inspector in Cuffs. The handcuffs became his trademark, and he was happy for any opportunity to use them. Just as he was happy for any chance to get out of the Seattle bullpen and pitch with a ball game on the line. When Latch went to the mound and called him in, uh, he, he didn't signal for him like this, like uh, the usual managers do. He, he gave it this sign. First time he did it, uh, he brought me in a game Bases loaded, one out. First pitch, I threw a foul ball, grand slam. We got out of the inning, we didn't get up any runs, but he called me in the office, he says, hey, Bill, he says, I don't know, because I don't know if I can do this anymore, because when I did this, he almost did this. And <laughs> Cardell would stop at nothing to shake things up. Though the Mariners went 28 and 13 during one stretch of 82, when the team slumped, he built a bonfire of bats. During another tough stretch, he decided to try a new look, but that just resulted in a close shave. It just didn't seem like the team was really playing well. So I said, well, if we're going to go out there and give half an effort, I'll go out there and pitch with half a face. And I went out and pitched with half a beard and got hit with a line drive right here off Barry Bunnell's bat and that uh, I think popped up to second base and was caught for an out. And in between innings, I went back in and shaved the other half off because I figured it was a life-threatening situation that if they're coming that close with half a beard, if I don't get it off, I might get one in the forehead. So I shaved the rest of the beard off. All kidding aside, Caudill's best pitching to date has been with Seattle. In 82, he allowed opposition hitters a skimpy 192 batting average, the lowest of any pitcher in the league. That led to 26 saves and a 2.35 ERA. Yes, the Seattle staff had markedly improved, and perhaps some of that improvement came from a Mariner who reached a magnificent milestone at the Kingdome. It hasn't happened since 1963. That was the year that Hurley Wynn became a 300 game winner. And tonight, Gaylord Perry tries to equal that achievement, an effort this evening to become the 15th player in big league history to win 300 games. I remember a dramatic night. I mean, everyone went to the ballpark anticipating a record, you know, and it was just delightful because uh, he responded. And the crowd, you could just feel it happen. You can just feel the crowd, every pitch, closer and closer and closer to it. At the end, people were standing. And everyone was standing, you know, cheering him on for the final pitch. And it was a very, very exciting and dramatic moment for this franchise. And, uh, you know, people still talk about it. On May the 6th, 1982, Gaylord Perry, one out away from 300. The 2-1 pitch to Randolph. Swung on, ground ball to Cruz. This should do it. He's got it. It's over. Gaylord has 300. Everybody mobbing Gaylord Perry as he goes all the way. His teammates come out, bud bullying, and Gaylord Perry becomes the 15th man 
in baseball history to win 300 games as the Mariners beat the Yankees 7 to 3. My oh my. I mean, to be able to go ahead and manage a, a person that won his 300 game and managing uh, Gaylord Perry, who's a Hall of Famer by no, you know, no doubt, uh, was an emotional thing for me, too. Oh, heck broke loose for us. It was like us winning the World Series. Uh, they had the, you know, champagne and everything else. Here's to you, fellas. Everybody over 40. Hey, Gaylord. Well, how does it feel, Gaylord? It was great. I tell you, it's like uh, the last game of World Series out there. How about 400? Oh, gee. <laughs> Gaylord Perry was an example of the success determination can bring. His 300th victory was a great night for the team, a great night for the fans who got to take in a little piece of history. But on other less auspicious occasions, Seattle fans could still come away with something memorable, from posters to bats to, well, just about anything. Hi, this is Tom Pachark of the Seattle Mariners, inviting everybody to come on out to the Kingdom on August 23rd for Mariners Funny Nose Glasses Night. I Be the first Tom. in your neighborhood Tom, to have... Tom, I'm sorry. August 23rd is not Funny Nose Glasses Night. It's huh? Jacket Night, Tom. Jacket Night. Yes, every jacket. kid 14 and under gets an official Mariners vinyl jacket free, Tom. Jacket, no nose. No Funny Nose no Glasses, nose. no. I'm sorry. Hmm. What am I going to do with 30,000 pairs of Funny Nose Glasses? That's your problem, Tom. When that day came, it was actually Jacket Day, but the prop for the commercial was the Funny Nose Glasses, and the people... We're very disappointed that they didn't get the nose glasses, so... Leading off for the Yankees, the catcher, number 10, Rick Sorrell. Look at that face. Just look at it. Look at that fabulous face of yours. I knew first. Look, I took at it. This was the face that the world adores. I think this is really a terrible idea. They're just trying to make fun of the people. Look at those eyes as wise and as deep as the sea. Look at that nose, it shows what a nose should be. It was a great event, everybody got into it, and uh, I think even uh, the cap of it was that when we took the team picture at the end of the year, uh, we had a team photo of everybody, and then, uh, and then we took it with all the crazy, crazy nose glasses too. So it became sort of uh, uh, emblematic of the Seattle Mariners for that year. The Mariners were 45 and 41 at the All-Star break, and they finished the year with 76 wins. Modest accomplishments, but still improvement. Unfortunately, the improvement was short-lived. In June of 1983, Rennie Latchman was let go, replaced by Del Crandall, who had been a Major League catcher for 18 years. But the 1983 season brought no comfort. One bright moment, however, included the ace of the staff, right-hander Jim Beatty, who enjoyed a day in 83 when he absolutely mastered the Royals. And that's a ground ball to Spike Cohen. He'll throw him out, and Jim Beatty just pops that right on high in the air and has thrown the first one-hitter in Mariner history. And he did it on only 87 pitches, would you believe it? The early 80s were representative of Seattle's first decade. A lot of ups, a lot of downs, and unquestionably a sense that at the Kingdome, anything could happen. For the Mariners, there may have been some rough sailing on occasion, but no matter how the winds blew, there were times worth remembering. Remember, 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 The city of Seattle grew into national, and for that matter, international prominence, because it was blessed with great natural resources, and it knew how to use them. The success of any Major League Baseball franchise also depends on its great natural resources. The disappointments of 1983 made it clear that if the Mariners were to contend, they would have to build from within. The Mariners have always recognized the importance of their minor league farm system, and now after their first decade of baseball, the Mariners realize if they are to become winners, 
homegrown products are going to play a very important role. After considerable trial and error, the Mariners knew that the only way up would be from within. And so the organization put increasing emphasis on the farm system. Though a payoff might be years away, minor league development was a priority. We added uh, uh, at least two more teams to the development program so that we now have five farm clubs, we have an instructional league, uh, we beefed up our scouting, uh, we uh, improved our, our coaching and our development process. Uh, so we felt that was really the most important thing we could do. A lot of people prior to me have done a very good job in signing young players, developing young players. In essence, I was looking to jump on the bandwagon. Talent like Matt Young helped foster the bandwagon effect. Young came up through the system around the same time as Jim Presley and Spike Owen, along with others like hard-hitting Phil Bradley, and a special pair in 1984, Alvin Davis and Mark Langston, all of whom would make their mark. In 1984, Alvin Davis enjoyed one of the finest American League rookie seasons ever. Davis came up from the minors to hit 27 home runs, drive in 116 runs, and hit 284. All that was good enough to be named American League Rookie of the Year. You know, that was the highlight, I think, of uh, my whole life, really, up to that point. And uh, just to uh, go out and, and have a super year like that and be rewarded, uh, you know, from the media and the people involved with baseball that, that, you know, had the best year of any first year player that year, it was really just something else. And, and uh, it's meant a lot to my life. And, and it's something that uh, I'll be able to tell my grandkids about, you know, with pride that, uh, you know, one year I went out there and, and had a very good year and, and I was ahead of my class. That same year, rookie pitcher Mark Langston rose to the top of his category with a remarkable 1984 season. Langston won a team record 17 games with a 3-4-0 ERA. But it was what he did on the final day of the season that really made him a standout, as he went after an achievement that had been realized by an American League rookie only three other times. Here he is into the wind and the 2-2 pitch on the way and the breaking ball, swing and a miss, and he's got it! He has the American Mark Langston and Dwight Gooden become the first rookies in Major League history to lead their respective leagues in strikeouts. Would you believe it? My, oh, my! In the 1984 Rookie of the Year award balloting, Mark Langston finished a strong second to his teammate. I really wish that we could have won it. Cole, you know, the uh, co-rookies of the year because he deserved it just as much as I did. He had my vote all the way, and... I was hoping that there, I told him that I was, I was hoping for a co, you know, I thought they'd drop a co on the beginning of it, but uh, it didn't work out that way, but still, it's, you know, it's, there's nothing bad with finishing second to him. Now, you might call this a footnote. Langston did win one other head-to-head -head competition, and that came the night he breakdanced toe-to-toe -to -toe with poultry's answer to Michael Jackson, the famous chicken. And there was no doubt about who put down the smoother steps. I think there's not even a question of that. I think I feel I'm definitely a better dancer than the chicken. Like I said, uh, it's tougher for, for him to go out there with only three toes. I've got five, so I think I've got the advantage over him. I, I had a good night that night, and uh, I think I, I did better than he did. Looking for something better themselves, the Mariners began the 1985 season with an opening series explosion. On April 13, 1985, Mariner Magic struck again. The Sox are jammed. He represents the winning run at the plate, and the place is going bonzo right now. Ron Davis, peering down, goes to the stretch. The pitch to Phil Bradley. The fastball belt to deep left field. Back is Hatcher. It is grand salami time. The Mariners win it 8 7. I don't believe it. Nineteen eighty-five turned out to be the year of the home run for the Mariners. Phil Bradley's newly developed home run stroke stayed with him all season long as he went on to belt twenty-six. The team leader was Storman Gorman Thomas, who slammed thirty-two, which also was fifth best in the league and earned him the UPI Comeback Player of the Year award. Another slugger delivered twenty-eight timely blows. Jim Presley. Nobody down here in the fifth inning. The stretch by McCaskill, the 1-0 pitch on the way. The fastball swung on and belted deep to right. Rupert Jones looks up. This will fly, fly, fly away. A three-round home run from Jimmy Presley. Make it 7-2 Mariners. My, oh, my. My, oh, my. 
My oh my. My oh my. My oh my. Three words heard all around Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. Words used by a man who has been behind the Mariner microphone since opening day 1977, Dave Niehaus. And he's brought to the game an original descriptive flair which these days can be heard on Cairo Radio and TV. All you need is a little action, and Dave will take care of the rest. Now the 1-1 pitch on the way. Swung on, popped up, right side. Will not score the run. Foul territory. Alvin Davis is over there. Backing up, makes the grab. Lemon faking coming down the line from third. Alvin Davis running it in. Throws to the plate. Lemon is out of there! Here's a stretch by Lamb. The pitch on the way to side. Swung on, line drive, base hit, left center field. Here comes Presley. He is going to score. The Mariners win it eight to seven. I don't believe it. My oh my! I believe there's fans out there over 50 that are going to have a heart attack one of these days because he he gets into the game so much. Since 1977, Dave Niehaus has done the broadcast of every Mariner game except one in 1982 when his son was graduated from high school. But a gentleman who can be found down the third baseline by the name of Merle Swenson can go Mr. Niehaus one better when it comes to attendance at the Kingdome. I've never missed a pitcher in inning since the Mariners have been in. That's, that's very impressive. He must really love the game. I'd like to meet the person, first of all, because I think that's a tremendous achievement, as it is. I've always said, if there's something I'd rather do, that's what I would do. But I, it just happens that I'd rather be here than, than any place. That's the kind of attitude the Mariner organization has been trying to foster over the past decade, reaching out beyond the city of Seattle to the entire Pacific Northwest. We've marketed ourselves as the Pacific Northwest team. I think it's very important to baseball I can, I can get carried away philosophically. I think it's very important uh, to the whole fabric, uh, uh, really to the country and the, and, and the geographical distribution of teams, that there be a team up here. And I think it's very important that the, that the team succeed up here. If the Mariners could bottle whatever it is that boosts them on opening days, success would be guaranteed. A 1986 debut at the Kingdom was no exception to that rule. Opening day, April 8, 1986, and in celebration of the 10th anniversary, Diego Segui, the opening day pitcher in 1977, threw out the first ball. Then, fittingly, the Mariners treated their fans to a dramatic battle that saved its best punch for last. Mariners a great job to come from behind to tie the score. The Mariners have been a good come from behind ball club the last couple of years, trying to do the same tonight. Force the set. And the one-two pitch on the way to Jimmy. Swung on. Well hit ball deep to left field. Back she goes. Goodbye baseball. Grand slam. Home run. Jimmy Presley. And the Mariners beat the California Angels. Eight to four. Holy smoke. Jimmy Presley ties it in the ninth inning. And he wins it in the bottom of the tenth inning. The Mariners defeat the Angels. Eight to four. Opening night. 19. Wow, what a night for Jimmy Presley and the Mariners. Yet on a night soon after, in the early spring of 86, manager Chuck Cotier and Seattle endured a game against Boston's Roger Clemens while Clemens was at the top of his strikeout form. On this night, Clemens was throwing harder than 95 miles an hour, and nobody knew it better than the guys who faced him. Roger at that time was, uh, it was amazing. He, uh, when he struck out the first six guys, I kind of, you know, I had a funny feeling that this was going to be a long night. A long night indeed, as Clemens went on to strike out a major league record 20 batters in nine innings. Being in the midst of a terrible early season slump didn't help the Mariners or Chuck Cotier. A change of leadership was deemed necessary, and Seattle went to great lengths to find the right man. I've been very fortunate. I've been at the right place a lot of times, and I think uh, this is the same thing. I'm at the right place at the right time again. Dick Williams has been a winner everywhere he's managed, and the Mariners didn't want to have to settle for anything less. The biggest thing we've done right, the single biggest thing at this point in time, I think is really hiring Dick Williams. Brings experience, brings some tradition, uh, brings a different type of discipline. When he says something, it is immediately accepted as the gospel by the ball club. I think he can only help instill a positive attitude in the younger players. 
I've learned an awful lot of baseball from him the last two months. He is very tough, but he's a very fair tough. That reputation for toughness doesn't bother Dick Williams. All he cares about is doing what it takes to get the job done. Oh, you baby, I'm good. Swim to see. Nothing I do for you that's too tough for me. I put out a burning building with a shovel and dirt. Everybody's uh, out there working hard and, and trying to perform uh, and trying to live up to, the, to, the, to his expectations. Dick Williams is quite a bit different from any manager that we've played for here before. There's an argument to be made or something. You feel like, well, the guy's going to come out and stick up for me. They say I'm tough and I'm demanding. Well, I am, I am demanding, but I'm fair. If I can, by my presence here, being a, a winner in the past, if it can rub off on somebody, especially my players, then we'll all make an impact. I'd like to help these guys uh, get that done. And if we do and we all work together, then I think we can produce a, a contending and winning ball club. The making of a winner often means making tough decisions. And the Mariners under Dick Balderson and Dick Williams haven't been afraid to make changes. One trade brought in Scott Bradley, who joined the club in late June and went on to hit 302. Ray Cadonis came to Seattle as part of the Boston trade for Spike Owen and David Henderson, and the young shortstop immediately displayed magnificent defensive abilities. In addition to Cadonis, the Mariners acquired pitchers Mike Trujillo and Mike Brown, as well as outfielder John Christensen. Trujillo has experience as both a reliever and a starter. And it was as the latter that he displayed just how much talent he really offers. Here with two outs in the ninth, Trujillo works on a one-hit shutout of the Kansas City Royal. Off the end of the bat, Presley with a long throw. He got it. Mike Trujillo has his first big league shutout, and it's a gem, a one-hitter. Seattle wins three to nothing. It was also decided that a starter might be better off coming out of the bullpen. So Matt Young was made a reliever, and he responded with 13 saves. Another move involved changing the role and smoothing the transition for 23-year-old Danny Tartabull. I think the biggest thing we did was move him out of the infield and get him into the outfield. This is probably one of the most exciting young men on the club. The ball just jumps off his bat. You don't see too many people at the... Uh, can drive the ball uh, as well as he drives it and get the results that he does. And Tartable did get results. Despite some early season health problems, the Bull amassed 25 home runs and 96 RBIs. Pretty potent numbers for a rookie who hasn't gotten carried away. I can't uh, say, well, I'm going to become the next Willie Mays because that's not just not going to work. Uh, I have to go out there and I've got to be Danny Tartable. And, uh, you know, what, what people say, you know, that's fine. It's flattering to me. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to hear that, but I'd, I'd have to go out there and play my game and try to do my best. Doing one's best is the primary goal in any sport. It's all a team can ask for, and it's what the manager looks for as he considers the complexities of the game. In mid-August, the Mariners were treated to the best in a battle against the Minnesota Twins, when in the bottom of the ninth, Alvin Davis squared off with a score nothing-nothing. Atherton, the rangy right-hander back with a 2-1 pitch now, and it's swung on and belts it! The very next night, Davis came up in the bottom of the ninth with a score tied. That night at the King Dome, and with Davis up, the scene was very familiar. Well, when uh, Phil made an app to bring Alvin up, I was down in the bullpen, and I kind of looked over at Mark Huseman and Steve Farova and just kind of said, well, what do you think? Can lightning strike twice in the same spot? Deja vu. Definitely. I was thinking about the same thing happening over and over again. 
Deja vu indeed. Davis facing the same pitcher with a score tied in the ninth and responding with the same kind of clutch hit. But this was double deja vu because it brought back memories of a bat night five years before when Tom Pashorek delivered the second of his back-to-back -back ninth inning game-winning home runs. A strange coincidence and a double pair of big wins for the Mariners. In the future, the big wins may start to come more frequently thanks to a solid nucleus that includes Phil Bradley, who in 1986 turned in his third straight top-notch season. Bradley finished eighth in the league in hitting and second in on-base percentage. Another part of the nucleus is a player who is coveted all around the major leagues and points in between, Jim Presley. An all-star in 86, Presley led the club with 107 RBIs and 27 homers, ranking among the league leaders in both those categories, as well as total bases and extra base hits. The rising hopes of the Mariners also depend upon Mike Moore, who's won 28 games over the past two years and is still entering his prime. And another name to conjure with is Mark Langston, who overtook Roger Clemens to win the American League strikeout title for the second time in his young and potential-filled career. Mark uh, is probably as good a pitcher uh, as you want to find in the major leagues. He's a left-hander with uh, outstanding stuff. No telling how good he can be. He's one of our, our bright spots for our future, and he should be a consistent big winner as the years go by. As the years go by, well, the next few years are critical ones for Seattle baseball. The hope is they will be strong winning years, bringing fulfillment to the fans and all the Mariners, past and present, who gave their best over the past decade. Inspiration, incentive, desire, you name it. The Mariners have all the motivation they need as they look forward to 1987. And if somebody doesn't believe it, the manager will make it clear come springtime when he puts his system into place. In spring training, you can lay your program out on a daily basis on what you have done and follow it up all the way, which we will do next spring. Uh, everybody works the fundamentals, but there's, there's certain ways of working them and getting your point across. And I've been successful with uh, the way I've operated spring training camp for, well, for 18, 19 years. And we're gonna continue to do it that way. And it's, it's not easy, it's hard work. If he takes the team out of spring training, the way I've been seeing, uh, the way he's been handling the team right now, I think you'll see a definitely a, a different ball club coming out of spring training. Sometime, you know, in the near future, we're all gonna gel at the same time and uh, be a contender. You know, we got tremendous talent. And we're right here. I'll tell you, we're, we're one or two pitches, not pitchers, but pitches a game away or, or hits away from being a contender. And, and I believe that's going to turn around next year. I really do. We're a young team. We're 10 years old. It's our 10th anniversary. Uh, we've come a long way, as they say, baby. And, and uh, I think the people really recognize that. The first time the Mariners win the World Series, which they will do one day, um, it'll be a huge celebration, I think. And uh, it'll be a big parade, and uh, everybody will come downtown. It's great. I'd like to be mayor then. The city of Seattle is envied across the country as a great place to live, work, and enjoy the good things of life. Ten years ago, the Mariners brought big league baseball back to the Pacific Northwest, giving all of us a chance to share in so many memories. The fans of Seattle were good to me personally. I really enjoyed my, my stay in, uh, in Seattle for the three years that I was there. 
I made it my home in the community. And it's one of the best places a, a young ball player can break in. I loved it. It's my favorite city that I've ever played in was Seattle. Uh, I was there for three and a half years and just loved it. People there treated me, you know, outstanding. Uh, the, the ball club, I mean, they gave me the opportunity to manage my first you know, job as a manager, and, you know, it, there's a lot of my heart left in Seattle. I think that's the best thing, just, just being here, having some of the players here, and, and uh, really getting, uh, getting a love affair going with the community.